Hello guys, we're back again, and this time we are on part three, deny yourself and follow Christ. Part three, deny yourself and follow Christ. So we're going to do something a little different to get this one started off. And what I want us to do is think about our top priorities, top priorities. So here it says, list, list your life priorities with the perspective that all of them come under your first love for Christ. So I want y'all to take a moment now and think about your priorities. Um, if you got children, if you are married, if you have a job. If you take care, maybe um, a family member like your mom, your dad, you might be taking care of them or any you know family member. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, you know you're investing in your job. Um, just think about that for a moment. So I just was throwing some things out there. Now, this is going to connect to what we're going to be talking about today. Deny yourself and follow Christ. Deny yourself and follow Christ. So here it says in the reading, it says, sometimes the truth hurts, especially when the truth contradicts personal expectations. A misguided belief among Jesus' disciples was that he would establish an earthly kingdom. They envisioned their own places of privilege within that realm. They never turned from such ambitious ambitions during Jesus' life. Even when he spoke, he spoke bluntly about the grim reality that awaited him in Jerusalem. It was only after his resurrection and ascension that they began to truly understand his mission. Opposing views. All right, so let's, let's still think about our top priorities. And then in the end, it's going to make sense of, well, what, what are we talking about here as far as their priorities here? All right, so it'll make sense in the end. Let's get you, getting you thinking. So today in this passage here, we're going to use a text um, coming from Matthew, the 16th chapter, the 21st through the 23rd verse. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he will suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He will be killed, but on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said. This will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. All right, so let's talk about this passage here because Jesus was telling him what he needed to do, but then here comes Peter. So opposing views. What do our moments of arguing with God say about our perspective of him? Okay, so some of y'all thinking for a moment like, hmm, have I ever argued with God? Or maybe you challenged God with what he was telling you and you probably was like, no, uh-uh, that ain't gonna happen. No, uh-uh, I don't believe you. Okay, so think about that, opposing views. On Jesus's final journey to Jerusalem with his disciples, he outlined what, he, what his enemies planned to do to him. He said they would succeed in killing him, then follow this announcement with the promise of his resurrection. But this good news appeared to make no impression on those closest to him. They were so taken aback by his statement that they would die, that his promise to return alive after three days missed them entirely. Peter did not even reference the resurrection when Matthew noted his reputable to Jesus. He took Jesus aside and strongly protested. The idea here is that of a rebuke, almost all or almost as if Peter were in authority over Jesus. The disciple who had proclaimed Jesus to be the Messiah only a few verses earlier and had been 
commended by Jesus for doing so, was now telling the very one he had called the son of the living God that he was absolutely wrong. Jesus replied with a strong statement by calling Peter Satan. Jesus addressed several issues. The name means adversity, so Jesus could use the term to identify and correct Peter's opposition. The idea that Jesus' self-sacrifice was somehow a mistake, however, could also point to satanic influence. Peter may have been responding to a tempting spiritual influence in that moment. Jesus' conclusion in his rebuke is a life lesson for today. Throughout the Christian life, there is a tension between limited human thinking and the wisdom and direction of the Lord. In the same way that legitimate affection for loved ones cannot be permitted to overshadow love for Christ, even reasonable and carefully constructed thinking must never be used over the Holy Spirit's leading. Over the Holy Spirit's leading. So what do our moments of arguing with God say about our, our perspective of him? And at times, some people have been very upset with God. Maybe you lost a loved one, okay? And maybe you were just arguing with God, like, why did you take them away from me? What, Lord, why did you do this to me? I mean, it's all kind of issues that people have, you know, questioned God about. Why did you do this to me? Because of the pain and the hurt and the frustration and the agony of it. So in that moment or in that heat of the moment, sometimes we do get like that. We do get just like how Peter did. Okay. In the heat of the moment, we do. Okay. But we just got to be careful about that. Because in this situation here with Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit leading him. But Peter didn't want to listen to the Holy Spirit. He wanted it to go his way or what he saw, how it should go. But Jesus was like, no, this is God's way. And you can't challenge God's way. This is what he wants. And it's all for the good. It's all for the good. So sometimes it does get hard looking at our situation sometimes and we wonder, um, why God is putting us through us or why ca God caused this to happen. And I've heard so many people question God about lots and lots of things, especially when it comes to death or losing a loved one or someone gets um, sick. Um, it could be even a child, you know, or your mom, your dad, or just a close relative or a friend. Um, it does happen when we get angry. It does happen. All right, the next part is in, uh, the subheading is world or soul, world or soul. And this part is using the text coming out of Matthew, the 16th chapter, 24th through the 27th verse. We must remember who Jesus's audience is in Matthew, the 16th chapter, the 24th through the 27th. The words here are often used in evangelistic appeals to unbelievers. However, Jesus was not speaking to unbelievers, but to the 12 and to other people who faithfully follow him. His statements then serve as precautions to believers, even if they perceive themselves to be established in faith. So let's look at the text here. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang onto your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and will judge all people according to their deeds. World or soul? What are some gain the world influences that tempt you today? So let's think about this question here. World or soul? Jesus' statement in verse 24 follows a sequence that is true at the moment of salvation, 
but has daily application in the life of faith. At salvation, the significant decision is made to give up control of one's life, take up the personal sacrifices represented by Christ's cross, and commit to follow Jesus faithfully as Savior and as Lord. The growing Christian constantly encounters life experiences and expressions of personal will that must be given up or reshaped in obedience. The idea of taking up a cross varies as different challenges to our faith present themselves. And following Jesus with unwavering ironclad trust is perhaps the most difficult lesson to learn, even for the most mature believers in Christ. Jesus' next contrast between hanging on to and giving up one's life can ultimately refer to dying for him but also connects with life goals and even daily decisions. This concept becomes clear with his question about material gain. Choosing profit over God's provisional leading may in the short term bring about outward success. But Jesus says that all possible success on earth for a lifetime is not worth losing one's soul for eternity. Theologians throughout church history have wrestled with the idea of whether or not a follower of Christ who has received salvation can return to an unredeemed life and forfeit that salvation. But here we see that the danger of turning and rejecting Christ is real. Note also that Jesus warns of smaller choices that forfeit a blessing or deeper work of God in the believer's life while he or she is in pursuit of corruptible gain. World or soul. What are some gain the world influences that tempt you? And looking at this picture here, y'all can see a lot of things that does tempt us. Lots of things that people are dealing with currently in the world. Got people that have the love of money. Some people are out here on drugs. Some people are out here are alcoholics. Um, some people are out here searching for love. I mean, it's just all kinds of things that we tend to do, all of us. All of us have done it. But it's not worth it in the end to gain the whole world and lose your soul. So what is God saying to us? By the time the disciples had spent about three years with Jesus receiving his teachings, we might expect them to have become so spiritually mature that they scarcely needed further guidance. However, the statements Jesus made to his closest followers only days before his crucifixion show that the path of spiritual growth is long and challenging. We too need the Lord's reminders to dedicate ourselves to him without reservation. We must seek the Holy Spirit to help us root out anything that would compete with Christ's rightful place in our hearts. As we love and serve him without compromise, we will continue to grow as people who deeply love and affectionately serve those around us. So we got to seek the Holy Spirit to help us with dealing with these issues, dealing with temptation. We got to seek it for help. All right, and so for further study for the rest of this week here, um, y'all can look at the next upcoming um, chapters here, the cost of discipleship, total devotion brings favor, a father's plea for devotion, careless words undermine devotion, devoted to one another, undivided devotion, lead away, led away from pure devotion. So all of this is as leading up into this lesson here, the cost of discipleship. So it does cost us something. It does. Okay. It's not like it's going to be handed out to us. It will cost something. So living it out, consider your commitments to God and whether you are fulfilling them, identify how you can connect your daily activities to who you are in Christ and ask God to help you love Christ supremely in order to love and serve others. All right, so this here is concluding the lesson on the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. 
which was a very, very good lesson here about being wholly devoted to Christ. All right. We talked about love Christ above all others and then deny yourself and follow Christ. All right. So I hope that that lesson there helps somebody motivate somebody, maybe answer some questions for someone and encourage them. Okay. So stay tuned now for the next lesson. The next lesson is lesson three. And that one is entitled Upside Down Living. All right. So stay tuned for the next one, Upside Down Living. All right. See ya.